Um, right, so um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, it's uh, Thank you so much for joining us on a, a, a Tuesday, very, very cold uh, Tuesday afternoon, especially um, here in Nottingham. It's quite it's been quite hazy the whole day. Um, we're very, very pleased to be having uh, to be hosting our uh, second uh, sort of a specialist event of the year for the PSA Environment Specialist Group. So we've titled our talk, our panel session today, um, Global Climate Politics After COP26 to continue some of the very, very important discussions that, um, that sort of uh, emerged and surfaced from the negotiations. Um, and as all of you will sort of be uh, very, very familiar, we have quite a lot of ground to cover and uh, in terms of progress, nowhere near enough has been made. And today, that's what our speakers are going to be addressing um, from various backgrounds. Um, so what just a sort of um, a bit of an overview, we'll be having a panel session um, with three of our speakers. Um, we'll be speaking for around 15 minutes or so each. And then afterwards, we'll hold a sort of an open format Q&A session. So if you have any comments or questions at any point, do feel free to pop them in the chat. And uh, one of my uh, uh, co-conveners will sort of help uh, um, feed those to me and, and I can feed them to our panelists. Um, so my just sort of uh, <laughs> introduction, my name is Heather Alberro. I am a lecturer at Birmingham Trent University and I'm one of the co-conveners for the uh, Political Studies Association's Environment Group. And I'm joined by my co-conveners, Ashley Dodsworth, and Mitya Pearson today as well, who will be sort of around helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. So again, a huge, uh, massive thank you to um, all of our, our participants and of course to our speakers. We have three excellent speakers. Unfortunately, one of them, uh, we are one speaker short today, but um, so, you know, provide sort of extra time, if anything, for uh, more Q&A, more discussion. Um, so that's one upside, uh, I suppose, of, of this. So. Without further ado, um, I will introduce our first speaker and we'll proceed from there. So I'm um, very, very honored to have Catherine Hofstadler, a professor of international development at the London School of Economics, and she'll be our first speaker today. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Catherine, and excellent. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much, uh, Heather. And I should say that I do have my PhD in political science, just in case anybody wondered about that. But um, I am now in the Department of International Development, and that's going to be shaping what I say today. I was asked if I would be part of this panel. I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to have to update my lecture for my global environmental governance class with what happened at COP26. And since my course really focuses on the experiences of developing countries in that negotiation. My initial discussion today is gonna to be quite focused then on what did that conference look like from the perspective of especially small and vulnerable developing countries. And I mean, the, these COPs are a kind of interesting moment for countries like this because they really do have more weight and importance in these climate negotiations than they do really in any other negotiations that that exist you know they're not big players in the trade regime they're not big players in anything having to do so with security but these little countries of 13,000 people 100,000 people can actually have real weight in these climate negotiations that said i mean this was a this was a cop that was in many ways pretty much a disappointment for them so it was a cop that raised again many of their very old concerns that really are almost as old as the climate negotiations themselves. Um, but all I'm going to be mostly highlighting some of their newer concerns that were specific to this COP. And I do think it's important for this set of actors to recognize that they came into this negotiation with quite high levels of distrust in the in the COVID period that um, I mean, I think we all know this, that when we look at COVID, one of the things we see that it was really a breakdown in global, in trying to create global solutions to a global problem. We saw states turn inward. We saw wealthy countries grab vaccines for themselves. And in fact, that had really direct implications for the negotiations in that many people from developing countries, many negotiators, hadn't had the kinds of vaccinations that would have allowed them to easily come to the UK. They don't have the kinds of elaborate home offices in many cases that allow them to participate remotely. And so many of them felt like they were coming into this conference sort of from behind and in ways that um, that really, I think, contributed to fairly high levels of, of distrust from this side issue that's not even the climate issue itself. 
Um, one of my colleagues who teaches African political economy asked me last week, uh, she said she had this reading that said that African countries didn't care about climate. And she wanted to know if that was true. And I said, no, it's not at all true. I mean, increasingly, those of us who follow these negotiations know that, that many of these small and vulnerable developing countries, along with the European Union, are the national actors who become most insistent about doing something about climate change. So they really have become protagonists in this, in this discussion. And many of them, although there's a lot of variation among the developing countries, and I could talk about that if people want me to in, in the questions, but many of them are the actors that really believe that the world needs to be a lot more ambitious in terms of addressing climate change. And that relates to the kinds of things that they pushed at this conference. Um, many of them are feeling the effects already of extreme weather events, many more hurricanes and floods and and, and droughts and those kinds of, of extreme weather events that they are experiencing. Currently, they are also seeing the, the effects of the slow onset of rising heat, um, rising water, especially the small island developing states. So these are issues where climate change is not so much a future problem for these increasingly, but it is actually a current problem. And, you know, just, and I'm sure all of us will say this in one way or another, but, COP26 still hasn't delivered on the kind of levels of climate ambition that one would want in order to deal with the climate problem. We are not yet in a world where countries are aiming for 1.5 degrees uh, of in, in, in a serious way. Um, countries are still on a trajectory towards much higher levels of, of uh, global warming. And so this is, you know, the, the, the conference chose to keep the commitment period open to see if countries would still come forward with more ambitious NDCs. But if this was meant to be the five years, six years now after the Paris Agreement, where the, the, um, the countries of the world really committed themselves to doing this on, a, on the scale that they should, um, this was a COP that was disappointing on its level of ambition. And then turning to the issue that was probably the most pushed by this set of countries in, in a particularly new way, um, you know, finance is, is a perennial issue for developing countries at the, at, the, at the COPs. That's probably their most important issue. And I think this, the Standing Committee on Finance, which at this conference had pulled together a number of the current status of, of the finance issue came up with these numbers that um, nationally determined contributions NDCs from 153 countries had identified 4,274 needs and that um, 1,782 of those had actually been costed out where countries said that they had some kind of specific need um, associated with, with climate change and, um, and those costed needs, the estimate is, would be nearly $6 trillion US dollars coming to developing countries by 2030. So that's a very large number that we're talking about. Um, it's, that's over the next decade, but it's still almost $6 trillion, 5.8 to 5.9 trillion that these countries are asking for. And when I mention sort of old complaints, one of those old complaints is way back in Copenhagen in 2009, wealthy countries promised $100 billion a year by 2020, and they still aren't there. So this is an even larger amount of money for the next 10 years, and the last 10 years ambition has not yet been met. So, um, and, and more specific, aims also are more of these needs are for adaptation, for responding to the kinds of changes that climate change is already uh, bringing, whereas there's more money for mitigation. But the big concern of this COP and the novelty, so much of what I've said here, I could have said if this had been for COP25, I guess, or COP24, or you know, many of the COPs in the past, almost everything I've said so far would also have been true. Many more needs, not enough funds, 
um, bigger and bigger gaps going and not enough ambition. But the big litmus test that many of these developing countries had for this conference was that there was supposed to be new funds committed for loss and damage. So it's an, it's an acknowledgement that many of these developing countries and other, other countries as well, but many developing countries are now beyond the world of adaptation. They are now into a series of irreparable losses, lives or species or land that might be irreparably lost and damages that are very substantial but recoverable to buildings, roads, power lines and the like. And so developing countries were really looking for, this was the big claim of the G77 at this conference, really looking for new promises, new sources of funds for, um, for loss and damage. They still want the adaptation funds and mitigation funds, but this was meant to be, in their view, additional to that. And it reflects the very basic kind of dilemma of the environmental justice dilemma, which is these are countries that will be strongly feeling the impacts of climate change without having substantially committed, uh, uh, without having substantially caused the problem. So they did not have success on this. This was a, a topic and where there was significant pushback from developed countries, from the countries that might have provided resources for this. Um, you know, and I think there are some good reasons for that pushback. When I look at the kinds of reasons that countries were giving, either directly or between the lines, I mean, this really would open up a potentially enormous category of additional funding, additional needs of the developing world. So it really is not a small change, but to really meet this kind of demand would be a very significant um, demand for new resources coming from, um, well, from the wealthy world, which is the only place from which these kinds of, this kind of scale of resources could really come. And there is, I think, you know, in, in the same way that adaptation funding has always been complicated because it's so hard to tell what is adaptation funding and what is development funding? Because building a new electricity infrastructure could be thought of as adaptation, but it could also be thought of as sort of conventional development finance. And whereas that's the adaptation dilemma, the dilemma for, um, for loss and damage finance is that the line between it and disaster relief is also quite fuzzy. How do we tell whether they're really this really is a climate driven event. Um, how do we tell whether what to what extent are our current mechanisms for dealing with disaster relief, the ones that should be dealing with these these problems as well. Um, so these are some of the kinds of questions that I think are quite important for thinking about just what kind of money is needed and where it might come from. And then, of course, there are the undeniable liability implications in that um, to, to acknowledge the right of developing countries to have funding for loss and damage implies taking on a kind of responsibility for causing the climate problem that countries have been, that wealthy countries have been uncomfortable with from the very beginning when loss and damage was raised. And then just, because I'm, I see I'm running out of time here, but, but you know, just the other thing that I think still is kind of, lagging for these countries that is really quite critical is to have a really good and complete set of accounting rules for even knowing what climate finance is, what counts, what doesn't count. There have been, uh, there continue to be inconsistencies of reporting and disagreements on, about, on what actually should be counted as climate finance. And the, the development of these rules has been very slow. And until these, these full rules are developed, and this is very much now you know, the agenda for the next year is it's still on the agenda, but it's been on the agenda since Paris of 2015 and even before. Um, these are just, these are, these are really difficult. It's really difficult to really talk about this critical issue of climate finance um, without having a clear set of rules for what even counts as climate finance. And the kind of arguments that took place at this conference about 
well, I mean, in our in our tabular format for accounting rules, should there be in a, a column for counting loss and damage finance? There hasn't there wasn't even agreement on that. And that would be at the very least a very small kind of concession to the idea that there might be loss and damage finance. The Warsaw International Mechanism, which deals specifically with these loss and damage issues, is also still moving. And it, it's, you know, if I can just close with this, I mean, it's one of the things I discuss with my students all the time. You know, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to evaluate these conferences, because in many ways, one of their biggest achievements is always that they keep going, right? That, you know, I, I wasn't sure with all the things that happened in 2019, whether that was really going to keep going or 2014 before it turned into the Paris Agreement, was that going to continue? Copenhagen in 2009, when they ripped up two, two years worth of negotiations, I mean, at some level, it really is an achievement that these, that these agreements keep going and that new topics keep putting, being put on the agenda. On the other hand, the pace is very, very slow. And with the very, very slow progress, I feel like for the developing countries in particular, that the grievances are growing faster than the achievements are. And that leads me to wonder, you know, about the long term viability of this process. And I'm hoping that my colleagues on the panel will now pick this up and have wonderful, you know, energetic solutions to this. But I think many developing countries are year after year becoming quite discouraged with a very, very slow pace of the issues that are most important to them. Thank you so much for that fantastic uh, talk, Catherine, kicking us off on, on, on such a on sort of a exciting sort of foot um, and keeping the discussion of, of environmental, uh, environmental and climate justice um, alive. Um, and I myself, when I was watching the proceedings, I could see, you can feel the sense of frustration and urgency in the eyes of uh, representatives from uh, low-lying island nation states, from indigenous, uh, indigenous cultures. So um, very, very important uh, uh, topic to sort of stick to here. And hopefully with the Q&A, we can explore this a little bit further. Um, so without further ado, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Um, so we've got um, Aaron Thierry. He's a postgraduate researcher at Cardiff University and a rep from the um, sort of offshoot of, of XR Scientist Rebellion. So over to you, Aaron. Thank you, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, my background's in earth system science. Um, so I, I used to work up in the Arctic studying climate feedbacks uh, from thawing permafrost up, up there. Um, I think I was basically uh, convinced at a certain point that we didn't need to study these problems anymore and we needed to, to focus on the solutions and those solutions are political solutions. So I, I'm now actually uh, researching um, in the Department of Sociology, uh, looking at um, how we can better communicate risk to the public about the climate crisis. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got some slides I'm gonna use to share today, uh, just to guide the conversation a bit. So hopefully this will come up now. Uh, can you see those slides okay? Great, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I, I was asked uh, to come and speak about my experience at COP26, uh, and mine was uh, slightly different, I think, from, from many, uh, because I was not inside the main uh, conference hall, I was outside on the streets with the mass protest movements uh, that were there. It was a major rally on um, the, the first weekend of COP. Uh, I think there was uh, roughly 100,000 people in the streets of Glasgow. And among them were a group of us scientists uh, from Scientist Rebellion who uh, took part in an act of non-violent civil disobedience where we blocked one of the main artery roads on across a bridge in Glasgow uh, and uh, held, held it for three hours. Um, and then eventually one by one, we were arrested and taken away. And this was really as a protest to say uh, out of despair, partly uh, out of frustration and, and also to kind of really um, highlight what we feel is, is the sham of COP26. It, 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 it is no longer delivering what it has to deliver. And we were there to call that out and to show solidarity with the people on the front lines who are dying already from the climate crisis. Um, our message was a simple one, is that we need climate revolution or we will lose everything. This is the, the severity of the speed of change that we now need to see has to be a break with the past. And I think 
what we're currently still seeing, as was just described by Catherine, is a continued uh, incrementalism that is just completely unfit for purpose in this time. Um, so what I'm trying to convey here is, um, I think what, what I see is this kind of real gap, and, and again, Catherine was alluding to this, between the political reality um, and, and the physical reality. And as uh, Hans Joachim Schellenhuber here, he's a founding director of um, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research in Germany. He's an advisor to Angela Merkel, the European Union, and, and more recently Pope Francis. Um, and he's saying that you know, political reality must be grounded in physical reality or else it's completely useless. And the two things have just become divorced from one another over the last decades. So just to recap, from my point of view as an earth system scientist, what is that physical reality that we have to keep our minds focused on? So it is that, uh, uh, this is a quote from Will Steffen. He's uh, the former executive director of the um, International Geosphere Biosphere Program. He's one of the world's leading earth system scientists. And he says it this way, it is becoming abundantly clear that this system is incompatible with a well-functioning earth system at the planetary level that this system is eroding human and societal well-being, even in the wealthiest countries, and that collapse is the most likely outcome of the present trajectory of the current system. This is from a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of, Royals, uh, of, um, uh, of Sciences in America, um, where they looked at um, what effect rising temperatures were gonna have on the habitability of, of parts of the earth. And you can see all of these areas in black in the tropics are areas where if we reach three degrees, which could happen by 2070, will be too hot to support uh, humans, right? It'll be uninhabitable. So this is, uh, as you see, large parts of India uh, and Southeast Asia, as well as across uh, Brazil and, and most of the African tropics. And, you know, what, that's, that's where the majority of the world's population is right now. Okay, so we're talking about displacing billions of people uh, as a result of th these temperatures within just 50 years, potentially. Um, not only that, but we are now at risk of really seriously destabilizing our entire planetary uh, system. So these are uh, nine planetary tipping points that ha have been identified by Earth system scientists and displaying as well the interconnections between them so that if we start setting off some of these uh, changes in the Earth system, we could actually create a cascade of impacts that lead from one to the other as a kind of a domino effect uh, that becomes ba basically uh, irreversible and unstoppable. Um, this is what really keeps uh, us uh, system scientists up at night. And again, we're starting to see that these are already starting to. Uh, to, to show signs of, of tipping. So uh, we're seeing signs from, from West Antarctica that the ice sheets there are already becoming destabilized. That could lead to multi-meter sea level rise over, over centuries, um, completely er eradicating whole, whole coastal areas. We're seeing that the Amazon rainforest is nearing a tipping point where it could start switching parts of it from uh, rainforest to savanna, uh, massive loss of biodiversity, also huge release of carbon, which would continue to warm the planet. That uh, is made worse by deforestation, which is also increasing now under the uh, leadership of Bolsonaro in Brazil. Then we see uh, as well that scientists are now warning that uh, the Gulf Stream, which brings heat up from the Gulf uh, and the tropics to Europe, uh, could actually shut down because of ice melt from Greenland. And again, that wasn't supposed to happen for a long period of time. And, and already in our models, we're seeing that this, this could be happening in the near term. So what's happened over the last 20 years is that science has, has really radically changed how we think about these, these tipping points. They're far more likely to occur than had been thought 20 years ago and probably could occur at 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming, at least some of them. And that shows why it's so, so urgent that we hold to this 1.5 to 2 degrees target. In this point of, from the point of view of the scientists who study this uh, and, and wrote up about it in the journal Nature, they're saying that in our view, the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency, both the risk and urgency of the situation are acute. So that's what the science is saying. We are now in an emergency situation. When scientists say we're in a climate emergency, when protesters say we're in a climate emergency, that is what they are meaning. It is not rhetoric, it is not uh, hyperbole, it is a description of the physical system and the realities that we're now facing. So what have we seen for the last uh, 30 years from all these COP meetings? 
well, nothing if you look at the Earth system. We have seen a continual rise in CO2 levels in the atmosphere. The concentrations keep going up exponentially year after year, breaking record after record. If you, we've plotted on here the different uh, conferences that's happened. You, you know, you, you wouldn't see that in, in the temperature record at all. Uh, and, you know, emissions are now 60% higher than they were in 1990, and they broke an, an, uh, a new record uh, probably will be broken this year. So, you know, we're not reducing emissions anything like what we need to be doing. So there's this massive gap between the political reality and the physical reality, and we have to bridge that somehow. Uh, we have to turn this around really rapidly, and that's going to look much more like an emergency wartime mobilization, in my opinion, um, much more like the res rapid response to the COVID pandemic, for example, than anything that is currently on the table. So this is Professor Kevin Anderson. He's one of the UK's leading climate scientists and he was at COP26 on the inside of the, the meeting. And this is what he described as well, right? He says that we have two separate planets almost with no connection between them. We have, we have the, what the science and the activists are saying and we have kind of all these pretty speeches that are going on in the main hall, all these promises. And the two things just don't map onto each other at all. So the science is telling us very clearly we have to leave the majority of fossil fuels in the ground unburned, okay? so. Um, this is a paper from Nature published last year as well, it says that by 2050, we find that to hold to 1.5 degrees Celsius, nearly 60% of oil and fossil methane gas and 90% of coal must remain unextracted to keep within the 1.5 degrees C carbon budgets, which means that basically all fossil fuel companies are completely overvalued and cannot realize the, the assets that are on their books if we are to stay within our climate targets. They also go on to say that oil and gas production must decline globally by at least 3% a year until 2050. Currently, their oil and gas production is increasing. But this is not a, a, a kind of a controversial or, or a radical position, right? This is uh, Fatih Birol. He's the executive director for the International Energy Agency. He says that if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, coal and gas from now uh, from this year going forwards, okay? That, that was an uh, announcement he made just this, this last year in 2021. The UN Environment Programme every year published a report called the Production Gap, which maps this kind of physical reality gap graphically. Um, and what they're showing here is that we have this blue line here, which was, shows the pathway of, emission, of uh, the production of fossil fuels that would be compatible with meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. In green, it's what would be compatible with meeting the two degrees, the very upper threshold. And yet in, in these red and brown lines show current projections for what uh, fossil fuel projection, uh, production will be like going out to 2040. So it's gonna to continue to increase and nothing like the decrease that is needed. Um, if we break that down by sector, you can see here uh, the same uh, graphic, but for oil, coal and uh, gas separately. Um, and in all cases, we're going to be overproducing uh, currently uh, if, if trends continue. So the summary of this report is basically that world's governments plan to produce more than twice the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, <clears throat> So just since since COP26 now, I went through some of the newspapers in the last few days looking at some of the headlines and, and what you're seeing is that they're continuing to, to uh, promote investment, promote exploration, promote uh, um, uh, um, new, new fossil fuel infrastructure, right? So Biden's administration has just carried out the largest oil and gas lease sale in uh, US history. China's coal production just re reached a record high in 2021. It looks to beat that next year. Um, we're getting the UK government's just given approval to a new oil field uh, to expansion in the North Sea. Norway's doing the same. Uh, investments increasing massively in Canada in oil extraction. You know, we're not seeing this transformation that we need to see whatsoever in the actual actions of finance, of government. Uh, you know, th this is not happening, basically, is my message. So it's all being hidden, I would say, behind this rhetoric of net zero. And as Earth system scientists are increasingly trying to, to warn the world, net zero is a dangerous trap because what it does is it's putting up a smoke screen saying, it's okay, we can carry on emitting fossil fuels today because in the future we'll come up with technologies, uh, our, our grandchildren will take out the fossil fuels, uh, the carbon emissions from the atmosphere and we can carry on emitting today and, and it's all okay. 
And, and basically that's just nonsense. You know, we shouldn't be relying on, on this uh, and, and to kind of, this is greenwash and it's, and it's the rhetoric that we're just seeing all the time from politicians, from companies right now that, that it's okay, they're gonna be net zero. Now you really have to ask, what, what do you mean by that? It's not okay for them just to say, we'll keep emitting now and, and offset emissions later. So just wrapping up, if we look at what, what current policies what current uh, actions are actually taking us towards, then we're heading towards about 2.7 degrees Celsius to maybe even as much as 3.6 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, which is that catastrophic outcome that I was describing earlier. That's, that's what current policies will take us towards. If we, if we accept all of the promises and pledges that governments have made, all their fine words, uh, which I would say were mostly empty words, then we are going, they say that we're on track for 1.8 degrees. It's, it's that's the difference. And I think um, what we have to really question is, is, you know, are these promises that government's making actually robust? Do, will they carry them out? And, and like I said, I, I don't think we currently have any indication that they're serious about meeting them. The uh, scientist who, who, put this to, who put that report together, uh, his team, he says that it's, it's all very well for leaders to claim that they have a net zero target, but if they have no plans as to how to get there and their 2030 targets are as low as so many of them are, then frankly, these net zero targets are just lip service to real climate action. And basically, I think Greta Thunberg sums this up beautifully in, in her rhetoric, which is, you know, basically government's promises are just blah, blah, blah. And I think that's what the science says. And we should be terrified by that. And I think we should be acting to try and force for a far more rapid action. And that's what we as Scientists Rebellion are doing. We are joining forces with the youth movement and, and the other global justice movements. And we'll be mobilizing again in April to take action. And I'd invite you to all join us and, and, and to get on the streets because you know we're out of time. We, we, we're way out of time. So thanks, thanks for letting me speak and I'll hand back to you now, Heather. Thank you so much, um, Aaron, for that much needed uh, wake up call and uh, highlighting the cap well, cavernous gap between uh, the politics and, and the science um, and sort of called to mind the sort of stats that came out around uh, the uh, relative impacts or, you know, of, of, of COVID lockdowns and that when it was, we realized that that had no impact, no you know, discernible impact on long-term warming trends. It shows you the scale of, of what we have to actually do. Um, so something to keep in mind there. Um, so, it's my great pleasure to introduce our final um, speaker. So with us today, uh, we've got Gareth Redman King. So he's a COP26 lead at the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. Um, and sort of hand it over, over to you, Gareth. Hello, thank you. Um, so I think I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic about um, COP26 and um, what it achieved and where it leaves us. But to be clear, that is not uh, that's starting from the point of not disagreeing with almost anything that Aaron has just said. So I'm not trying to kind of paint an alternative reality. It's absolutely clear that um, we are already all losing from the climate emergency, some more than others, some more rapidly and more obviously than others. And, and even if we keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade, then we've, we've already lost so much at 1.1 degrees and the losses at 1.5 degrees are will be horrendous, but they get even worse and, and exponentially worse beyond 1.5. And the UN process is about minimizing and managing those losses, working to avert worse, even worse and worst possible um, consequences. And on, on that measure, I would argue that the outcome of COP26 left us with some progress and momentum and therefore hope even although it obviously also left us with anger, disappointment and frustration and, and, and fear um, at not enough um, progress. But as, as Catherine referenced, COP26 was um, the five year point, it's only six years because of, excuse me, because of COVID. Um, COP26 was supposed to be five years on from Paris. Um, it was supposed to be the first stage in the Paris Agreement ratchet mechanism um, to lever up amb ambition on climate action. So I do think it's important that we left Glasgow with a commitment to speed things up, to, 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 to sort of ditch that five-year um, ratchet process 
um, and, and require parties to come back sooner than that for the next round of emissions pledges. The Glasgow Climate Pact um, acknowledges the science very starkly um, and is clear both that the aim is to keep warming to 1.5 degrees and that is an advance, that is a strengthening of the position um, in the Paris Agreement um, and therefore that emissions need to be cut by 45% um, percent, uh, this decade. It calls on parties that aren't aligned with that to come back ahead of COP27, so within a year, well within nine months now, um, with stronger NDCs and, and net zero targets and says that all parties should come back in 2023 with enhanced NDCs. So there is acceleration um, and a stronger acceptance of, of, of what the purpose of the, the process is. Secondly, I think Glasgow achieved movement outside of the NDCs, sending uh, and strengthening market signals um, in the process. 109 countries pledged to cut methane emissions by 30% this decade. 23 joined the list of nations committed to phasing out coal. 39 countries and development banks promised to end finance for fossil fuels. Um, and nations responsible for 85% of the world's forests said they would work to end deforestation by 2030. Now, okay, one of those and responsible for a large part of it is Brazil. So, you know, there's obviously reasons for skepticism, but it's still a big commitment by the rest of the, the nations in there. A group of countries uh, and companies made a pledge to speed uh, phase out of petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, a small group said they would end exploration. Two small groups said they would end exploration and production of fossil fuels. And I think all of this, plus the historic inclusion of coal in a COP decision at all, um, along with the first mention of fossil fuels since Kyoto, adds up to some powerful market signals. We've already seen them impact on carbon prices um, in Europe, which are higher than they've been for a very long time and have stayed uh, high in recent months. And these deals can speed up the transition, the, the transition towards clean energy um, and real net zero, not um, greenwash net zero. And for coal in particular, it feels as though the death knell um, was being sounded, is being sounded rather more strongly after Glasgow than it was before. And thirdly, and you know, this relies on uh, the extent to which you have faith in the process or not, but th techy, but important if you do, um, uh, that Glasgow finished off on the Paris rule book and introduced built in the transparency rules, five year timeframes for emissions pledges, the framework for carbon trading markets, all eluded the last couple of cop cops, all are important um, progress, they drive ambition, they avoid cheating. Um, Catherine's talked about the other side of the balance sheet in terms of um, developing nations and where not enough progress was made, but there was some progress made and that there was progress worth banking. Um, it was clear from the fact that small island states and other climate vulnerable nations accepted the weaknesses and last minute language um, changes in the interest of not losing what had been achieved. So there is still perhaps surprising level of, of faith in the process not to want to lose that progress um, and, and to have left Glasgow with an agreement. So the commitment to doubling ad adaptation finance and a process agreed to define the global adaptation goal um, operationalizing the tech, you know, getting to the point where the technical support and assistance on loss and damage is more than just a just a website, um, but all obviously with significant shortcomings. Most starkly, um, as Catherine said, the the failure to land a financial facility for loss and damage for all the reasons that she set out, um, and the failure on the part of rich countries to live up to their promise of hundred billion dollars a year for developing nations. That was acknowledged very bluntly in the final language, deep regret, uh, urging in detail the work needed to deliver on it. That's, you know, that's kind of, that's almost swearing in, in, in kind of UN language. And it was all made much more stark, of course, um, by the fact that it wasn't met at a, a COP where there was some crazy big money uh, numbers splashed around in the discussion around the sector deals um, and in the deeply spurious claims of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero um, to be mobilizing $130 trillion. All of this leaves a lot of work ahead for the UK presidency. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means for the, the UK presidency in terms of implementing um, the Glasgow Climate Pact and, and building, um, uh, building progress towards COP27. The UK presidency runs until the 7th of November when Egypt um, takes over and COP27 begins. I would suggest there are five areas of focus for the UK, which, as it happens, also helpfully overlap with the speech made by the COP president this morning, who set out four of them in his priorities. The first is um, ongoing commitment to the job from the UK. Clearly, Alok Sharma is still firmly in that COP presidency role. Um, every sign from the speech this morning that he remains committed to it. Um, but he needs the full authority of the, the UK Prime Minister, whoever that may be within the coming weeks, um, for the UK's delivery, both as a party 
um, to the Glasgow Climate Pact and to drive the diplomacy for, for global delivery. Sharma needs to be able to influence his colleagues in the UK not just to do the right thing, but also not to do the wrong thing, not to do more of the wrong thing, things that can undermine the UK's position, decisions on trade, spending, planning, things like coal mines and, and new oil exploration. Second is the diplomacy that's needed to drive um, stronger emissions globally. Um, we're on track for emissions to go up by 13% this decade, not to fall by 45%. So the UK is going to need to be able to leverage the, the, the nations that made those commitments on sector deals, on coal and methane and the like, to be building those into their country pledges, into their country NDCs to strengthen them further. It's going to need to, the, to push the big emitters like the US and China to bring out the, the shorter term commitments and actions um, this decade that will get on track for the pledges that they've made. The laggard G20 nations like Australia and Brazil, both of whom have elections this year, um, with and both of which have particularly weak, um, shamefully weak targets. Um, the, the UK is going to need to put pressure on them to turn up next year with stronger targets um, and, and to put pressure on wealthy nations um, to invest in emissions cuts from big developing nations along the lines of the deal that was done um, with South Africa um, to help hasten its uh, weaning off coal. Third is shifting the financial flows to support in developing countries. Um, you know, hardly any of the rich nations are giving what anyone assesses as being their fair share of the promised 100 billion with an honourable uh, mention to Germany and a, a bit of a nod to France. But the 100 billion itself is not on track to be delivered until 2023, three years late on commitment, 14 years on from when the promise was made. Um, it's not just finance from governments that the UK needs to focus on, I think. Um, those wealthy nations um, are the big shareholders in multilateral development banks and global finance institutions. They have a job as the presidency to put pressure on those banks, on those institutions to shift their finance flows. And there's a very powerful proposition from um, Barbados Prime Minister Mir Motley at COP26 um, for billions in IMF special drawing rights to be made available for uh, to fund um, developing countries' climate action. On private finance, the UK presidency should be well placed um, to put pressure on, on private finance to make real the claims and commitments made in Glasgow by finance institutions, because not only is there no substantive evidence of the trillions promised or even the trillions, you know, waived at Glasgow, um, not even for mitigation, never mind for adaptation, but also the 60 leading commercial banks globally, um, as one of the facts on, on Aaron's slides showed, you know, have poured $3.8 trillion into fossil fuels um, since the Paris Agreement. And then, of course, there is loss and damage. Um, as a wealthy party to the UNFCCC, the UK has one view, um, but as, as the presidency, um, they will understand how focused developing nations will be on the process uh, delivering actual proposals for a finance facility in Egypt in November. And, and, and not doing that, I think, would get us a lot closer to, the, to that thing um, that I think it was Catherine said she feared in 2019 of, of, of it actually just derailing the process entirely. Fourth is expanding and delivering on those sector deals. They were very heavily driven by the UK in the presidency role. So they're going to want to ensure that those countries that made pledges follow through. Um, holding signatories to account for delivering on the pledges that they made, working to add to the countries signed up to each to, to, broad, to expand their impact, um, and drawing together the pledges on uh, coal, fossil fuel financing and exploration, um, and deals like the one made in South Africa um, to drive progress on the historic commitments in the Glasgow Pact to phase down, uh, it would have been phase out, phase down fossil fuels, uh, and work to ending fossil fuel subsidies. And then fifthly, for, for any... Uh, COP presidency is the credibility that comes from delivering domestically, delivering at home, the credibility that comes from doing the right thing uh, and not doing the wrong thing. So, you know, that means the policies and investment that deliver the UK's um, NDC, which is ambitious compared to, to most others, you know, delivering a real net zero strategy, not a greenwash one. So um, actually putting the plan in place and doing it, it means increasing its own commitments on climate finance, um, potentially further country deals like the South African one, returning overseas development aid to 0.7% of GDP, putting pressure on the multilateral banks and on the City of London. Um, but it could also mean no new fossil fuel intensive infrastructure, 
the UK led the way on uh, coal phase out. So could they not be in the in the vanguard with the small number of countries who've already committed to an oil and gas phase out and sign up to the book Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance? And it should mean leading the way on getting deforestation out of UK supply chains, because that is, you know, with 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 economies as big as the UK, that is genuine pressure on a country like uh, Brazil um, and the sort of pressure that can short circuit what what a presidency in in Brazil might want to do. Those are my five things that I think are important for the UK presidency for the coming year. It's no small list, but there are only nine months left to go. Um, but I would just make one more point about um, the UN process and COPs, um, particularly in the context um, of some of what Aaron was just saying. So, so overall, clearly, I think um, that COP delivered some progress and built on momentum um, from Paris. I think before Paris, we were looking down the barrel of four degrees plus of warming this century. Last year, the commitment still put us above three degrees. Before COP, it was reckoned to be around 2.7. We come out of COP with short term, uh, short to medium term commitments that, that imply warming of 2.4. But on that chart from the climate action tracker that we saw a minute ago, you know, if, if nations get on track for the commitments that they've made, then it could uh, maybe keep warming, you know, at or below um, two degrees this century. Now, that's still a huge gap to 1.5 degrees, let's be clear. And let's also be clear that the if in my last sentence is doing some seriously heavy lifting. But there is momentum from Paris and the window to keep warming to 1.5 is still open. Um, and it's locking countries, I believe it's locking countries into the UN process that has achieved this momentum alongside um, growing pressure from people around the world. I believe that's what keeps nations tied into the process and turning up to make new commitments. Um, we've got no immediate alternative to the process, to COPs, to the UNFCCC. Um, and if we do tear it down, if we do declare it failed and pointless, um, firstly, I think that fossil fuel companies and fossil fuel producing states would love that. Um, but secondly, I don't think we yet have something that goes in its place that would maintain the momentum that we have achieved. I think it's the UN process plus people pressure that has built the momentum, even although we're so far off where we need to be. And I think we undercut and tear it down um, at our peril. And I'm stopping there. Thank you so much for that um, excellent talk, uh, Gareth, um, and highlighting some of the um, areas where there's been potential and what to look out for, um, and especially with the with fo the focus on the UK in particular as as the host of the negotiations. Um, so thank you um, to, to all three of you for kind of setting us off. Really, really fantastic talks. I think complement each other quite well, and they touch on on different aspects. Um, different key themes, I, I would say, um, that, that relate to, to COP and what has been sort of achieved, what to look out for so far, and really where we have to sort of um, uh, sort of pay, pay most attention to. Um, so I think, you know, I th I'll, I'll just kind of read some of the questions that we have so far that have come in from, from the audience and just feed them feed them to you guys and, and then see how that goes. Um, so I'm just going to read from the... The Q and A box. Um, okay, so we've got one question. First question is for Aaron. How much? How much were you coordinating your activism at COP twenty six with groups from other countries? Will this be continuing in the future? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely, we were, um, you know, coordinating to a, to a certain extent, and we, we're doing that much more actually. So in this mobilization going up to um, uh, in April, that, that's going to be being coordinated across 20 different countries around the world. They're hoping that about a thousand scientists will be involved in, in that action. Um, I think we were very um, aware of a lot of the conversations going ar around um, uh, the kind of COP26 coalition, civil society groups. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around um, you know, the inequality of, of the situation that we're facing and the fact that, you know, as been discussed on this call, um, very much it's the most vulnerable in the world who, who are feeling the impacts of climate change already, uh, but they are also very much the least responsible for causing the, the crisis. And I don't think that that point's been made enough on the, on the call, because I think what's really clear when we look at, you know, where are these emissions coming from that, that's driving the the, 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 the the concentrations of greenhouse gases up and up. Um, 
roughly 50% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions are, are caused by about 10% of the world's population. Uh, whereas the other, the poorest 50% of the world's population are responsible for less than 10% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. It's actually been calculated that if you look at the carbon footprint of um, the, the global 1%, uh, it's something on the order of 30 times that of the poorest billion people. So, you know, when we look at that inequality, it's so stark, it actually gives us quite a clue as to where we have to make these changes in order to get these really rapid reductions in emissions. And um, I think that there's some hope there because the, again, the same maths, the same calculations you can say, um, if we were to reduce the uh, emissions of the wealthiest 10% by a third uh, to the, to, um, sorry, to the average level of the average European, uh, that would reduce global emissions by a third straight away. So, you know, we could get some really dramatic changes in, in global emissions, um, whilst not massively changing uh, the living standards of, of people, right? So, so I think we need to be thinking far more, for, far more radically about this, you know, why is it possible for people to fly private jets around the world? Why is it that they can have luxury yachts in a world that is so carbon starved and there's so much uh, harm being done because of that? We, we need to ask those questions right now of our leaders and, and our, of our governments, um, rather than just assuming that the world as it is right now will continue going forwards. Thank you so much for that, Erin. Um, yeah, that kind of brings to mind with, especially in regarding the question of climate finance with the recent release of the, um, the papers on the sort of incredible wealth hoarded in offshore tax havens. And if you think of a fraction of that could just, what it could do, it's it's wild. <laughs> um, so absolutely the, the question of inequality um, as, as uh, Catherine's and, and talk as well highlighted is, is something that is significant. I mean, without addressing that, you um, wouldn't have sort of the same impacts. Um, so I've got another question, I think maybe just to pose to the panel and whoever wants to uh, shed light or uh, can do so. So let me just, oops, there we go. So to what extent was the role ambition of the new US administration a disappointment at COP26? And if so, how much will this continue to constrain global action on climate change going forward? Anybody wants to take a go at that? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in um i think um i think the us the us ambition um was quite encouraging um you know they've 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 made a commitment to um a, a target which which the climate action tracker rates as you know getting getting a lot closer to being sufficient than um you know th than you would expect from the world's biggest emitter um, they are still a long way off on their commitment to climate finance because I think this administration's forgotten that you know the previous administration was completely absent for that period. But it's it's not and and you know and there's we've seen considerable ambition in in what Biden has set out in terms of the the Build Back Better um, uh, I think that's what it's called um, fund that he's been trying to get through Congress. The problem doesn't lie in the scale of the ambition that they set out before COP. It it lies in the fact that you know that. Congress doesn't take place in secret. You know, the rest of the world can see that. Um, you know, one senator from West Virginia is um, is is busy blocking the whole thing, and you know, the rest of the world can see um, the limits that there are on 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 the Biden administration's ability to deliver it. So, it 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 inevitably, even before COP started, weakened their position um, in the negotiations. I think. That, that it was clear that there are significant limits at the moment on, on what they can actually achieve. And, you know, if you look at the polling in the US and the likely direction that the midterms will take in November, it, it doesn't look as though it's going to get any easier. Um, so so I, I, don't, I don't think it's a problem with the ambition. It's a problem with the, the execution, really. Maybe I'll come in here, too, with my American accent. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's really quite interesting because I think back in 2009, when, when Barack Obama came in, I think there was a hope that a new U.S. administration would actually do something. And in fact, some of my work on Brazil and its climate legislation shows quite clearly that one of the reasons that Brazil wrote a national climate law in 2009-2010 was exactly because they were expecting climate legislation out of the U.S., border carbon taxes, the whole array of things. So. I just didn't see any of that kind of belief at this point. 
that that this new administration would have an impact like that. But just to answer the rest of the question, you know, this is one of the big problems of the climate negotiations, which is that there is this kind of giant hole at the center of them where the country that is without question, you know, the biggest emitter for the longest time with the most power to actually address this issue is not playing its part. And I think, you know, that just leaves a giant hole. I mean, it's not as bad as it was because I think, you know, with Trump, it really was the case that like people could take on lack of ambition too. You know, when Brazil's Bolsonaro says, oh, well, we'll drop out of the out of the Paris Agreement too, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's not, so Biden is sort of stopping that kind of slide, which the US can lead a slide downwards to lower ambition, but it is, it is a giant hole in the middle of the climate negotiations. And I think we don't, we have to acknowledge that. And it's an unjust one. You know, just to go back to the question of justice, there is like a fundamental un injustice here, and I'm happy to call out my country for for that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Catherine and, and, and Gareth. For that um, did uh, any other any other comments on this point before um, I move on to other queries or? Yeah, I definitely. <laughs> agree there with, it, with that kind of final point, Catherine, um, and considering, um, as you point out, how maybe uh, how much worse a, potent, a second a second Trump uh, sort of uh, term could have been in, in, in relation to US climate politics. It's, uh, yeah, it's um, quite a sort of uh, some cause for hope. <laughs> um, so got another kind of uh, general kind of panel question here. So uh, I'd be really interested to hear about the speaker's views on the Article 6 finalizations around ITMOs and around the new mechanism for carbon trading, opening up private carbon markets to nations. Where do you see this heading? And do you think the carbon is a realistic solution or another means of developed nations, nations shifting responsibility? So I always slightly hang back at this point because uh, Article 6 is really complicated and um, slightly terrifies me. So if anybody else is uh, ready to jump in. I was waiting for you, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I sort of my, my general my general take on, on where we got to with Article 6 is it could have been worse. Um, it's um, there was the there was at once. I mean, that, that it was closed, that it was agreed is 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 a step forward, given the way it's been blocked at, at previous um, uh, COPs by um, countries who are explicitly trying to game the system and build in the gaming. Um, uh, so, so, so some of the some of the kind of positioning, um, even by the middle of the second week in Glasgow, um, raised the risk that that we would lock in um, horrible kind of double counting um, of the emissions that would just make it meaningless. You know, make it worse than you know. This is the you know Article Six is the, is the the very essence of you know a bad deal is is worse than no deal. Um, that was you know the, so the double counting risk um, was uh, was was done away with. Um, there was a lot of the kind of push for historic credits to be included that was done away with as well. Um, uh, so it could have been a lot worse. Um, it does, it still has huge problems. It could have been an opportunity um, to, to cancel a lot more historic credits as a means of generating um, higher prices and therefore potentially another source of income, potentially even for loss and damage. Um, but uh, not as bad as it could have been, says a non uh, non immersed in this um, expert. I, I think you're probably more immersed than the rest of us are. Um, we'll pretend that the missing speaker was the one who was really going to understand Article Six, um, because you know it is it is it has unfortunately become the kind of thing that if you're not if this is not what you do, it's really hard to understand exactly what they're doing. I mean, so I really have kind of more an observer's comment on it. 
which is that if you are looking for a set of market forces to operate properly and you think that that is a possible solution to reducing emissions, it is a really big hole again in the negotiations to not have a global carbon market. Um, you know, this really just is something that needs to be there. There's a lot of things like the, like the red plus mechanism, for example, that just has not been moving forward very quickly because of the absence of this. So there's, to the extent that you're looking for these kinds of market mechanisms to, to play a role in generating the quantities of finance and the amount of action that you think you need, the, the fact that Article 6 you know, six years on from the Paris Agreement is still the big unanswered piece is a very, very big gap. That's kind of more just the, 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 the stakes here. Um, and, and as I say, I, it's our missing panelist who was the one who knew all about the details. <laughs> I think I'd probably just add a, a few words of caution. Um, I think uh, partly, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, we really need emergency action. We need, you know, really drastic intervention with markets here to, to, to stop fossil fuel production. And that's where I think we should be focusing on uh, rather than coming up with fancy trading mechanisms. We just need to try and find ways to keep fossil fuels in the, in the ground. Um, I'd, I'd also, um, uh, and, you know, a, a lot of these schemes are, are based on, um, you know, ideas around um, planting trees to, to kind of draw down carbon and then get offsets for those which you then trade and so on. Um, you know, a lot of those come with major ecological implications, those schemes, right? So, so you're, you're talking about, you know, taking food uh, land out of production that could be used to grow food uh, and then putting trees on it to, to draw down carbon uh, and then potentially burning them in for feedstocks and, in, and things in, in power stations. Um, which has all sorts of implications then for how we uh, use land, uh, people potentially be displaced off land uh, in order to, for people to, to you know, to, uh, create new assets and, and so on. So, you know, a lot of these solutions have massive justice implications as well, uh, and also massive implications for other um, critical biosphere processes. Um, so I think we really need to think holistically about these things. And, and I think sometimes just handing it over to the market to deal with without thinking through these, these implications and, and trying to um, actually, um, it could make things just as, as bad, if not worse. So, so we really need to think carefully about this is my, my view. Not least that even with, um, even with very rigorous standards for what um, passes muster as a carbon credit, um, you know, there are there are some very big companies that have bought an awful lot of carbon credits, which literally went up in smoke last summer um, in forest fires in the US. So, you know, how do you reverse account this is very complex. Thank you so much for that. Um, so <laughs> loads of questions coming in. I really, really love this, uh, this engagement. It's fantastic. Um, got kind of a general uh, panel question as well. Also thinking about this, this sort of uh, relationship between sort of more specific micro level actions and more holistic or structural changes. Um, so will relatively short term economic domestic policies continue to override coherent global climate agreement and actions? <laughs> Anybody want to have a go for first? I might, I might have a go at that because actually I think you can turn it around the other way. And, and actually I think we're much more likely to see these decarbonization being driven by the, uh, locally domestic policy changes uh, rather than these international agreements. And in fact, I think, you know, the extent that the international agreements can go anywhere will depend on, you know, how much traction they have at home and how, how uh, much the public are pushing for it in, in those nations. So um, for me, I think, you know, looking at things like uh, what Catherine was saying with the Build Back Better or, you know, the Green New Deal kind of st stimulus that, that was being talked around, job creation, um, you know, mass retrofit of houses to, to insulate homes, uh, end fuel poverty in, in the UK, for example. Um, we're talking about um, you know, uh, you know, redesigning cities around public transit and, and things. Those are all major, uh, you know, in, uh, investments in uh, things that make people's lives better in their local uh, neighborhoods, in their cities, at the same time as, you know, creating jobs 
good work and so on. So, you know, there can be ways of, I think, coming up with domestic uh, agenda policies that, that fit, uh, suit, uh, solve people's problems uh, that they're facing right now, that then massively reduce emissions as well. So I think that's that's where we should be really having having these conversations. Uh, and that then opens up the, 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 the door, in my opinion, for much stronger international uh, agreements as well. Um, I'd like to hear what the others have to say about that. Yeah. I mean, I actually have really liked the discussions around the Green New Deal and all those kinds of things, but I was actually going to take a different tack on answering this, which is to, to quote, I think it was the, the BlackRock CEO, actually, who wrote a letter to investors this week. And he said, you know, we're not woke. We're not, we're not dealing with climate change because we're like greenies or anything. We're dealing with climate change because these are like the concrete considerations of how you make and lose money in this current, you know, climate system. And that, you know, I think there has often been in these negotiations and in lots of places in both domestic and international climate politics, this kind of understanding that there are these sort of short-term economic interests that are, you know, outweighing climate interests. But if you listen to the BlackRock guy, He's telling you that actually that kind of equation is becoming less and less the case. And it's even more the case when you start looking at a longer term front time frame. So if you're somebody who's in the area of project finance and you're funding things that are going to be paid off over 20 years, well, you know, you're probably not going to be putting your money into coal plants. And you, you may not be putting your money into something like a hydroelectric dam because, you know, Brazil's hydroelectric dams are all going dry. Um, the odds that they still will be actually producing electricity like they would have 20 years ago has already changed. Um, one of the strongest kinds of dynamics that is kind of sloshing around the Brazilian political system in really interesting ways is the fact that the same agriculturalists who are currently responsible for deforestation also are increasingly seeing that local climate systems and probably larger climate systems are becoming drier and drier and making their current agricultural mode less possible. So I think we do, we are starting to see, this is the, I guess the positive side kind of, of, you know, loss and damage. We are starting to see that the climate system itself is changing the profitability of different kinds of economic choices. And, um, and if BlackRock is seeing it, I think others will be seeing it also. I think um, uh, to put it in put it in a, a, a UK context as well. There's um, there's a you know again not sort of woke um, sandal wearing types. So oh God, I start sounding like Boris Johnson when I say things like that. But a, a group of ec a group of economists, a company that that work quite regularly for for government, did an analysis a couple of uh, 2020 um, on the the benefits that come to the economy from investing to deliver net zero in the UK um, and and you know and, and to deliver it yes by 2050 but on a on a on a scale that meets carbon budgets along the way that means it's real net zero not emitting now and doing it later but doing it on a proper trajectory doing it on the on the CCC trajectory um, it, it delivers 90 billion um, pounds a year in co-benefits that you get eight pounds back for every pound that you invest in it um, a piece of analysis that we've done this week on missed opportunities if um, if if David Cameron hadn't cut the green crap in 2013 then um, you know our, our our energy bills would be 170 quid lighter in 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 epcd houses the sort of the the standard kind of um uh, not good enough level of energy efficiency in homes in the uk so this 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 energy bills crisis that we've got now would be better if we had invested in things that would actually save people further money because they would be living in in you know in better homes warmer homes healthier homes so we we we're, we're failing to do the 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 thing we should learn from the fact that we're failing to do the thing that not only is the right thing for climate but is also the right thing for people is also the right thing for um for the 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 the, the co benefits and savings um, that you get. Uh, it's the same with um, investing in rapid deployment of renewables in the UK so that we can end the period of our history on which we're reliant on um, importing gas from, uh, from Russia and, and, and other parts of the world which are less than stable um, in terms of how we relate to them. And you can see it, I think, the other way as well. Um, 
So, you know, the reason that um, China um, sets a mandate for the transition to electric vehicles um, and, you know, ignoring the, the kind of the, the burst of new coal now in the gas price um, crunch in China, the reason why China is investing in renewables to the extent that it is, why it is um, the, you know, second or third in the world on offshore wind, for example, is because of local benefits as well that, that, that affect their economy on the macro scale, but that affect people's lives. So, so clean air, um, the, 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 the air pollution that comes from power stations, the air pollution that comes from um, from from petrol and diesel vehicles so you know that's that's government at the biggest most sort of um autocratic level you can imagine doing the thing that has that co-benefits on the local level um for the macroeconomic benefit as well Thank you so much for that. Um, any other responses or any other comments on, on this point? <laughs> it always reminds me of that uh, kind of well-known activist slogan that I always see on placards, uh, that there's no sort of economy in a dead, uh, on a dead planet. So it's, it should be a fundamental concern for, for any business, anybody who's involved in, in, uh, in, in uh, enhancing profits. <laughs> well, it would, be, it would be, it's quite the thought experiment to take any business and try and work out how their business continues if you completely trash nature you know take it back to the roots you know yeah so um so got some few more questions coming in here um so question i and again, kind of sticking with the, the question of empowering uh, communities. So how can we empower communities to act locally? Um, XR is still keen to get protesters on the streets, but what if we turned our action to making change locally um, to sort of affect the transition? I guess that's for me to maybe kick that one off. Um, so, uh, I think I think we need to take action on all levels, right? And I think I think we can take action um, ourselves as individuals. We can take action, you know, within our families uh, and having conversations with the people that we around us, um, work work colleagues, um, you know, people in our neighbourhood, etc. And then and then we can uh, take local action, like you was, your, your questions are saying. Um, you know, and that might be going to local council meetings and, and asking for particular changes to, you know, bike lanes in our local area or better, um, you know, uh, uh, changes in, in the uh, pension schemes of the local uh, um, uh, council run uh, uh, services and so on. Um, th there's so many ways we can take action in, in our local areas. But I think at the end of the day, we, we also massively have to take action, um, you know, at the state level and also internationally. And um, that's going to need all of us putting pressure where that where that counts. And I think occasionally that means protest. And, and I think that's that's what uh, I think is a very effective route. But it doesn't mean I don't do those other things too. And I think what, what I would encourage people to do, um, you know, with all of these things, is to find where they're most comfortable and then go a bit further, <laughs> and and just keep trying to push yourself to do that bit more. Um, and I think particularly um, when, when it comes to um, you know, we, we have to hold our politicians accountable. I think that that's, that's and, and also, you know, major corporations, I think, because those are where those decisions are being made right now. And, um, you know, if we, if we don't show up and we don't tell them that, that we're watching them, that we're, you know, absolutely demanding that they do something about this, that then they either don't know, or they just, they can get away with not doing anything. So, so really, um, you know, being, very careful about who you're electing, being very careful about who you're campaigning for, uh, making sure that you tell everybody about how important this is. Um, that's that's kind of what we all have to be doing in all parts of our lives now, I think. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass over to the others. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, that's the most powerful thing we have is our voice. Um, MPs in, in this country don't hear from us enough on these issues. Um, and the less the less they hear from us, the more they their frame of reference is kind of set by um, by places like 
you know, like Australia or or or, or parts of the US, where you know it's 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 in the sort of culture war space, and there is there is opposition, and so MPs just assume that it's contentious, and it makes it harder to engage them on it. It makes them harder for them to make to so look at look at the local traffic. Um, the low, low traffic neighborhoods in in the UK and and the way that a very small number of um, uh, voices drivers um, well organized um, ha have have ridden roughshod over what the polling shows is a majority um, you know is is popular with the majority of people in most areas um, to have those lower traffic neighborhoods um, and that's in part because politicians uh, don't hear enough from us on climate and the environment. Yeah, I would agree with those. And I would just add one more point, which is that, like, I think local level activism of the kind that Aaron and, and Gareth have been talking about is absolutely critical. But the other time that they become even more critical are the times when there are national governments, for example, that are very hostile. So in both the US and Brazil, two of the countries I know best, you know, both of them have gone through periods of having incredibly hostile national level approaches to climate change. And in those cases, then it becomes even more critical to look to see what kinds of things subnational actors are doing, what kinds of protest movements there are. But you know, while while those things are always necessary, they become just that they're what you have. You know, when it comes to times when national governments are not in favor of action, um, and you know, there are like sometimes. Often you can you can approach your MP and have an impact there, but there are some governments, and I'm sure the UK will have them again. Um, you know, some governments that can't really be influenced on these issues in a positive way, and then the local level and other levels of action become all the more critical because of that's what you have. Yeah, thank you so much for your excellent points on this on this matter. Um, and absolutely, I mean, uh, local pressures and you know, in terms of so many um, really really interesting um, things in terms of climate change, uh, climate uh, mitigation going on at the local, uh, city level, the regional level, um, and in, in particular when there is that gap uh, at, at sort of the sort of policy stage from the top down. Um, so um, we have kind of running out of time, unfortunately. So we've probably got time for a few more questions, a couple more questions. So. Um, try to get in as many as we can before we start to wrap up. Um, but um, so this one in particular is directed towards Gareth. However, I think it's a very important one that um, uh, we'd like to see sort of what, what everybody's sort of thoughts are on this because it kind of brings to light um, the sort of uh, the climate uh, action tracker, which um, I think the last I checked still um, rates zero countries in, in sort of the green realm that are compatible with a 1.5 degree uh, uh, sort of target. So I'd uh, really, really interesting to see what you guys think of this. But the question is, uh, uh, Gareth, you've mentioned faith in the process a number of times and the idea that 1.5 degrees is still alive if countries meet their pledges. Why do you still have faith in the process? Why do you have faith that countries will meet pledges? No, it's a good question. Um, faith is the wrong word because faith implies such a sort of blind belief in, you know, um, well, it, it implies something that is not what I mean. I, I think what I mean is that um, whilst we have, I really value the other routes as well. I really value the other thing. I really, really value the pressure that um, that, that organisations like XR have put, that, that, that people going out on the streets from any background put. You know, all of those things are incredibly important. But we also have this international process and it has moved a long way from where it started. It's taken a long time. It's going too slow. It hasn't achieved enough. It doesn't get us to a point yet where we um, can sit back and have faith that, that, that all is well. But the process is a thing that causes these countries to have to come together and discuss this and debate this and agree this and, and commit to things. You know, it, it, it would have been... Not all that long ago, it would have been unthinkable to have to have got where we got to with the Paris Agreement. It would have been unthinkable at the time of the Paris Agreement when net zero was radical and something that, that civil society did not really believe it would get into the Paris Agreement. It would be unthinkable that we had gone further in terms of that commitment to 1.5 in the Glasgow Climate Pact. So that, that, that Russia and Saudi Arabia 
by the way, again, not faith. I do not have faith that Russia and Saudi Arabia are going to deliver their net zero targets that they're committed to as it stands at the moment. But the fact that they even feel they need to turn up and make those commitments is important. The fact that they need to be there, the fact that everything that's in that agreement, the Paris Agreement, everything that's in the Glasgow Climate Pact, could have been blocked by these countries, could have been killed off by these countries. So that has moved us somewhere, and it is what we have at the moment. Um, and I, where, where I get closest to faith is that I don't want to break, kill, get rid of that. I mean, not that it's in my gift, like, and, you know, if developing countries lose faith in this, then the process will change dramatically. And that's the most important thing that the UK presidency, the Egypt presidency and the UAE presidency need to bear in mind as they kind of manage the delivery of the Glasgow Climate Pact. But if we, if we, if we just get rid of that process and say that we will have this other thing instead, then we need to design the other thing from scratch, or the other thing needs to exist in a way that will still bring those countries together. So I, I, it's, it's not, so faith is the wrong word, and, and I, I shouldn't have used that word, but um, a, a belief in the importance of maintaining this process and if we can build something more, if we can go, and you know, the, the fact that the sector deals did something outside of the process that might, you know, bring other countries in and might move the markets faster and might move, you know, might, might mean that there are countries that actually do more on emissions cuts in the, in the 2020s than they've committed to in their NDC, I think is powerful and important. And if there's something else that we do above that, and if it involves banning private jets and yachts and you know like let's let's take all the things that we need to do and let's do those things as well but I fear what happens if we break and remove that process and say let's now move to something else and we don't know what it is yet so that's what I think I mean by faith and also there are not on the climate action tracker point sorry there are um I think there are a couple of countries that are in line with 1.5 there is one country that is in fact uh, climate positive however they are tiny um and I think one of them is Bhutan and it's a forest kingdom so you would expect it to be um fairly uh, positive um in terms of its climate impact um but there are um, countries who have committed to something that looks genuinely like what net, net zero should be. You know, there are countries like Sweden who have put it in law, have committed to it in 2045, so they're going before the middle of the century. They've got something akin to a plan. Um, you know, France, similarly, you know, has the, the thing. We, we have it in law. We have ambitious targets. We don't have a plan yet. Um, you know, but there are countries that are close to committing to that net zero as being what we need, but not not enough and not the, you know, not the biggest of them yet. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I mean, I definitely <laughs> hear what you're saying, Gareth, and I, 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 I just feel myself that we have to be really careful that we don't let um, a faith, as it were, almost not not yours necessarily, but like generally in this system, blind us from the fact that it's 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 failing us, right? So so this kind of sense that this sense that we well we have to keep it alive, we have to keep going with it, even though it's not delivering uh, because there's nothing else in town, right? And then it kind of stops us from being able to to kind of recognize what's going wrong with it because we're also invested in in keeping it going. And I think for me. Um, what we really need to recognize is that, um, yeah, like you said, this, this you know, it, it, it's it's definitely part of the picture, right? We we're going to need to have continued international negotiations, so so that's that's going to be be there. But what what we need is a, a movement that can really challenge uh, governments to go far faster in lots of different other areas. And um, I, I I think what my call is to the people watching this tonight is you know don't think that this international negotiation is all there is and that that we have to trust it or put all our faith in it you know we have to be out there making it change right and make things go faster making new possibilities so so my call is to really you know for everybody listening um this is not good enough we need to somehow push us to get far faster and and go into an emergency mode because you know, we are, like I said in, in my talk, in an emergency now, and, and we have to treat it like that. And I don't think governments are. So let's let's try and force that to happen. Um, Catherine, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm not sure if this will be read as optimistic or positive or, or pessimistic, but I mean, I feel that the same forces 
that are making it very difficult to advance quickly through the cops. The fact that you have very wealthy and powerful actors among governments, among businesses, you know, they're going to prevent meaningful action by any alternative. And so, you know, I guess I don't have that much hope that that we can get around that fundamental problem of the fact that the wealthiest and most powerful actors in the world, large numbers of them, are still really not on board with quick climate action. Um, that's why, in some ways, I put you know my biggest faith in in almost the processes of climate change itself. Although one of the things we have seen so clearly with COVID is that it's like it's not it, it's not enough to have things go horribly badly that that's not enough to show us that we have to act. So COVID has made me like very skeptical even of this, but, but I would just kind of retreat to that statement that says, you know, it's not, it's not as though the cop has created the possibility for these actors to have powerful roles that they wouldn't have in another setting. They're gonna have powerful roles in whatever setting we have. And because of that, and, you know, I'm not so convinced that there's a that there's much reason to step away from a, a process that actually, in this case, I think I would lean to Gareth's position on this. That, you know, there are 180 countries that have written a climate plan. In the absence of a process like the COP, we might have 40 or 50. I mean, you know, I just I think that it is a process that galvanizes attention for at least a couple of weeks every year, and 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 galvanizes at least the, the, pre, the pretense of action, but, but it goes beyond that. I mean, there are a lot of things that I think have been made possible in the context of these negotiations that would not have happened without it. Did it, did it produce enough? And here's where I think, you know, I don't agree that it has produced enough, but I don't think Gareth thinks it has produced enough either. But I just have some questions as to whether another alternative would somehow be able to come, overcome those exact same forces, which I think would just show up to obstruct in other forms and other places. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no. so I think that is pessimistic, isn't it? <laughs> No, I, I think this is a, a really, um, we've only got two minutes left, and I think this is a really, really, uh, really good theme, important theme to sort of wrap up on, especially this discussion between the difference um, between faith and hope. You know, uh, hope is, uh, so faith uh, sort of projects this idea that something is, it can be assured. Hope is precisely possible because the future is never written. Nothing is guaranteed. And so through things like concerted collective action, we can sort of bring about one trajectory versus another. Um, and with the kind of role of power, um, absolutely. However, um, you know, they are a tiny percentage of the world's population. Kind of going back to Percy Shelley's famous poem, like, ye are many, they are few. They, they have a lot of political power, but they are also few in number. So there is scope there for, for some change eventually, though I, though I do uh, I do sort of take uh, Catherine's point <laughs> that um, that is a significant sort of block there. But um, yeah, without, uh, we've only got one minute left. Um, I just, before we end, I just really like to thank our for your excellent talks. I think everything complements each other so well. Such a range, uh, an important and interesting range of perspectives. And thank you to all of our participants for your fantastic uh, questions and comments. Um, you know, we can continue the conversation after this. Of course, if, if you haven't already done so, do follow us on Twitter um, at PSA Environment. Um, and um, hopefully we can sort of continue this discussion um, after, after today. Um, but thank you again to everybody so much. Um, uh, and I hope you have a really pleasant rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.